How's it going, everybody? This is Andy Timmons from Dallas, Texas, and you're watching Rome by Wild. Thanks for making the interview, of course. Well, thank you so much for, for coming to see the show. We've had many great experiences in Italy, and especially Rome, you know, going back to maybe 2006, our first dates here, you know. So we have a, a big fondness for Italian fans. They're very passionate about their music. And so, yeah, we always look forward to being here. And, yeah, it would be a great, great show tonight, we hope. Um, you are playing some of your eggs, of course, tonight. Yeah. And um, the, you had this album released in 2011, yeah. which is um, a new interpretation of Sgt. Pepper and yeah. the Beatles. How was the project born and uh, how did you get it, got it concrete? Well, it was, the, the idea actually was born in Italy. We were over here on one of our tours and it was an arrangement we had done of uh, Strawberry Fields Forever. And, uh, you know, it was Ricardo Capelli, our, our tour manager that he books the gigs over here. And every night we know that that song would really go over well because it was very familiar, it's a Beatles song. And the way we were playing it, this particular interpretation apparently was, uh, was being received very well. So Ricardo said, you know, next time you come back, maybe try doing a whole set of Beatles, right? And I, my initial reaction was like, we can't pull that off, but you know, guitar, bass, drums, instrumental version, one song is great. But it did kind of, you know, it got my, curiosity up like that. Well, what if I try this song? How would I arrange that on the guitar? So I just kind of started doing it as a hobby. I was, um, you know, working on various songs and really not with the intention of doing a record, but uh, I think the next one that really fell under the fingers well was uh, Lucy and the Sky with Diamonds. Well, that's, that's nice. That works well. The way to kind of play it. Um, little by little, I just started going down a path of, well, how cool would it be to play the whole Sgt. Pepper record? Just, just for me. Just for sitting at home, playing the melody, seeing what I can incorporate into just one guitar performance, not, not overdubbing all these things. And, uh, and that, that was kind of the beginning of the project, and literally over the course of about two years, really, I was just kind of working it and piecing it together, and the more I worked on it, the, the more I realized, this might work, you know? And uh, I remember playing some stuff for Mike, the bassist was over, uh, you know, for a rehearsal, and I kind of mentioned, like, yeah, I've been working on these songs, I said, well, let me hear you play Mr. Kite. And so he saw how it was kind of coming together, and he got a little excited about it. Then some time went by, and we were in the studio working on another Andy Timmons band uh, record project. Um, and some extra time became available at the end of the recording session. The engineer was like, well, what else do you have? I'm like, well, I'm out of songs. And, and Mitch, the drummer, said, you know, what about all the Beatles stuff you're working on? Let's, let's just do it. Let's just do it. So that kind of, that's kind of, it just kind of happened. So it didn't start off I like, I wanted to do a Beatle record. And it actually, even even throughout the process, we did all the all the basic drum and bass tracks in, in, in two days. And I kept about half of my guitars, but I wasn't happy with certain things. And I really, my confidence wasn't high. Like this is this is a bold project, you know, to tamper with Beatles and doing it like we were doing it. So it, once once I finally was happy with the guitar performance, I thought, okay, this is strong. I think it I think it's worth putting out here. And luckily, I mean, the response has been great. I mean, even a lot of I was hoping the Beatle, I mean, the, uh, the the guitar fans would like it, but the Beatle community too has really embraced it, you know. So that's been very gratifying. Labor of love. And is there any project you are releasing and is coming soon? Well, the, the next thing, uh, I just recorded a record with Simon Phillips. And Simon's a drummer that I've worked with in the past. You know, of course, he's with Toto. Uh, we did some, some fusion music, his solo music back in the, in the late 90s. And so, this, this year marks the 25th anniversary of his first solo record that was called Protocol. And he wanted to do a tour like we used to do. And so I agreed to do it because I love Simon, I love work playing his music. And he, he, his initial idea was like, I'll just release a compilation of old stuff. But I was going to be in, in LA where he lived. I live in Texas. I was going to be in LA for the NAMM show. And uh, he said, we're going to be out here. Let's just record. Let's, let's do it. We'll do it in a week. I'm like, great. That's ambitious, right? And we did, we did a whole record in a week, and it turned out great. I'm mean, really, really happy with it. And I've been kind of playing a lot of 70s kind of fusion stuff lately. So for him to ask me, it was just the right time. I was okay, great. So that come, I think that comes out in November. We're going to play, I think we're playing in Italy. But we're going to tour in Europe in November. So. And then over the course of the year, too, I'll be trying to finish the Andy Timmons Band record that we started 
back in the, when we did such memory. So there's lots, lots to come, yeah, I'm excited. Um, do you ever take the time to improvise on stage? Oh or gosh, yeah, as much as possible. There's so, there's something like, like a lot of the Beatle arrangements, um, that like the end of Mr. Kite and the end of Strawberry Fields, that was all improvised. Every other note on that record, I really had arranged exactly how I wanted to play. Because on, that, on, the, on the original Beatle record, there's not a lot of guitar solos, there's a few, but occasionally, because I didn't, I was doing it without lyrics for the third verse, second, third verse sometimes, I would give myself the latitude of, okay, I'll replace that verse with a solo. But man, this better be a strong solo if I'm replacing a, a Beatle melody. So, certain things I like to play verbatim every night. But there's some songs like Electric Gypsy and Cry For You. And there's some songs I play different every night. So I, in, improvisation is very important to me because that's real spirit. That's really connecting with the band and the audience. Though, that being said, the things that I do play that are more constructed, they're going to be different every night just from the energy and the nuance and just how I'm trying to get the energy through the instrument. And that depends on everything in the present moment. You know, that's that's what I love about it. that's what I love about live music. It's that energy that it can happen in a room that you can't replicate on a recording. You can't see it on YouTube. You have to be in the room to really feel that the right way. Yeah. Uh, you've done with many artists and guitar heroes and so many uh, musicians. Is there anyone you like to jam with that you have not ready? Uh, Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr and Jeff Beck. It wouldn't have to be at the same time. That wouldn't be bad either. I, those are three people. Now, I've met Ringo and I've met Jeff Beck a few times. I've never met Paul. That's kind of my dream. You know, I'm hoping that he hears this, the Sgt. Pepper record. I think he'd like my, the, the version of She's Leaving Home. I think he'd like that if he heard it. So that would be my those three guys. Yeah. Jeff Beck to me is the he's the pinnacle of expression on the guitar. He's, Really great, yeah. uh, how much work does it take to become a guitar hero? Well, I don't know about being a guitar hero, but just to, to be a musician, um, it's a well, it's it's a lifetime. It's it's a it's a dedicated lifetime. It's but you have to love it so much that nobody ever has to tell you to work or to to practice or it should be it should there should never be a thought process of like, gosh, I have to. It's a privilege, you know, it was just, for me, it was always, I love to do it. I, I wanted to spend every moment I could playing my guitar. I just, I loved it so much. And just the way, you know, it made me feel, you know, and I think that, you know, how you connect with something in your childhood really lasts a lifetime. And so, for me, it was a, it was very much an emotional release um, to play music, to, so just to listen to music. You know, there was, music was everything to me back then. It was, it was a great place to, to just experience and feel, you know, whatever it might be. So, I, I don't know what it, to be a guitar hero, I have no idea. But I do know that um, anybody that, that really achieves greatness, whatever instrument or whatever their chosen profession is, it just, it takes love and, and passion and not settling, you know, not settling for okay, you know, because you never get there. If you ever feel like you've gotten there, What's the point, you know? Just, you should go do something else. But I, I consider myself, I'm a student, I'm a, I'm a beginner. You know, I've got some abilities, but I haven't, I haven't, I know I haven't scratched the surface of what I'm capable of. So, I'm, you know, I'm really, I'm, and these days I'm very inspired, I've been practicing a lot. Whereas I, I went years without really practice, practicing. I, I was playing a lot, and I was always writing, which is great. But now I'm kind of back into the mode of thought, like when I was in school, when I was in music school. I studied two years of uh, classical, classical music, uh, my first two years of college, and my third and fourth year I was, I was a jazz major at the University of Miami. Those two years I think I was the happiest I've ever been. And then the years immediately following that, when I was in that mindset, I was surrounded by amazing musicians playing guitar all day and then gigging all night. And just always, always learning and pushing you know, as I went on through my career, I was always playing and I was working, but it was a different, it was a different mindset. It was about songwriting and, and those things I'm very proud of. But now that I'm back into that, really working and learning, and I'm happier than I've ever been, you know, in, in this part of my adult life anyway. 
you reach your fame with danger, danger, yeah. the band danger, danger. How um, have uh, as your approach to music changed after that that experience and from then to now? The only thing that changed is my approach to the music business. That's that's that was the big that was the big learning curve for me. It was just to kind of see it's it's very different now, but at least how the music business it was it's such a mysterious thing. You know, because all I wanted to do growing up, and even through when I was working professionally, I just wanted to be the best I could be. I wanted to be a great musician. You know, I didn't, I didn't, initially I didn't aspire to be a Danger Danger. I wanted to be Mike Stern and Miles Davis's band, you know. I, I just wanted to be a great player. And then that opportunity came, up, came along to join Danger Danger, and I thought, well, you know, this might be a great opportunity to get, you know, kind of into the major label league, you know. Musically at the time might not have been exactly what I wanted to do. That being said, I did love it. You know, I really I learned so much. I had such a good time. There's a bit of that rock and roll fantasy you have when you're a kid. You know, the first concert I ever saw was Kiss. I saw Kiss in 1976 uh, on the Destroyer tour, and uh, you know that's when I knew oh, I, this is what I want to do. This is you know I was already playing guitar, and that's how I learned how to play guitar was the Kiss Alive reference. So I saw them. I didn't, Never would have dreamed that years later I'd be opening for them, you know. Because we had two different tours with uh, Danger Danger, we opened for Kiss. And so, in that regard, that Danger Danger for me was a great kind of childhood fantasy. But even through those through those years with Danger Danger, I was still recording my own music and my solo stuff. So that's what I really wanted to do. I, jo I joined a band, Danger Danger. I joined a band that was only formed, you know, I was kind of a side man, you know, part of the band, but it wasn't my band. And, I'll, and, and I, I enjoy I enjoy being in that role. I like being a leader in my own band, but I also like being just a piece of the puzzle. What you know, trying to just do what's right. Like when Simon Phillips' group or Olivia and Jones and the different people I work with, I love just doing. It's because I I love all kind of music. I love whatever it might be. I, I like anything with a guitar. I, I want to know how to do it. So for me, that 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 was that was great. But but just seeing how the music business was run and how disadvantageous it was for the musician. And once I once the band kind of disintegrated for a while there, I I, I learned a lot about myself. I knew what I didn't want to do. The, the, the goal for me wasn't to be on a major label. I thought it was. But I thought, that's horrible. You don't own your music. You, you work because we recorded a third rec record for Epic that they just decided not to release it. Why would I work so hard? That's my art. Why would somebody else own that? So after that, I just went back to Texas and started recording all my own music, owned it, and just put it out, licensing it. It's a much smaller operation, but Matthew, it's, I get to do what I love to do. Can you figure out any reason why uh, there are no female guitar heroes? Wow. Um, well, there's Emily Rimler and there's Jennifer Batten. My friend Mimi Broche is a great young girl that's playing great guitar. Um, but that's a good question. Leona Boyd, who I just met, she was a great classical guitar player up in Canada. I never, I never really thought about that. But I think, would you, would you say Orianthe is a guitar hero? Yeah, I mean, there are no females who are so famous for being that good in playing guitar, yeah. for being musicians. You know, I, I can't really speak to that because you know, there must be great you know, female guitar players out there. But it, it doesn't seem to traditionally have been something that a lot of girls have done. But then when you look at look at heart, how could you not think that Nancy I mean, Nancy Wilson is a guitar hero, which is huge. Um, but it's a good question. I don't. I, I can't answer it. I don't know because you're right. There's not that many uh, obvious guitar, not on the level of a Hendrix or any Van Halen. But there will be. If there's not, there will be. And clearly, it just has to be some women that want to do that. <laughs> and I think Neely Brosh, you know, she's going to be, she's really going to be great. Which is your favorite stage to play? Do you like uh, more playing in small places with uh, where you can approach the fans or big stages when you have your audience and just play with one audience at a time? Yeah, I think for the music that I really love to play, which is very, it's, it's very dependent on really subtle dynamic and interaction with the band and then 
also with the audience. The smaller the place, the, the better. Um, some of my fondest memories of gigs that have been really emotional for me have been really small clubs. Um, I mean, it is fun. It, that, that was the thing with touring with Kiss, opening for Kiss. We were playing some bigger arenas, and that's it's a different thing. It's more about the chord and the power, and, and that's fun, you know. But it's just a different. I don't. The communication that I want to convey is much more intimate and direct, and I between myself and the band members and the audience. So. We've talked before about the big music changes, music business changes. Music business, yeah. Yeah. Um, now people who love rock uh, usually look at the best at bands who were in the 70s and yeah. 80s. Um, where do you think the future of the music is uh, taking us? It's, again, that's, that's difficult to speak to. Um, what, I, what I love about the current state of music and creativity is like there's really no boundaries anymore. There used to be a lot of boundaries because labels kind of made boundaries. And, and radio and MTV made boundaries. There's no boundaries anymore. Um, you know, people ask me for advice about what, what, what would you tell young bands? I, these days, it's, it's kind of great because all you have to do is be great. It's a funny thing to say, but it's really true, whereas in the, in the major label years, in the, in the classic 70s, 80s, you had to be great, but also you had to be in the right place at the right time or have the right connections. To get discovered now, all you have to do is record a video and put it on YouTube. If you really have something great to offer, if you have a great song, if you have a great sound or unique approach, I think people will find it. And it's a level playing field in that you can be a, a little kid, you know, in Caserta or wherever, and, and if you really have something to offer, you have the ability to give it to the world. So that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, the problem now, I think, is that there's so much content, it's, we need a filter. That's, that's what radio and labels used to be. They were a filter. You know, here's, here's, here's what we think sounds good. So, but it's exciting, you know. It's, it's, a, it's a different world because, you know, people don't buy as much music, they can steal it if they want. But there are, there are some people that realize the importance of, of supporting their favorite artists. I buy music all the time. I watch a lot of YouTube videos too. I mean, so but I do try to support as much as I can. I mean, there's there's some records I've bought five and six copies of. Just it's it, just the way it is. Just yeah. Thank you very much. Thank for you guys so much. Thank you. Questions. Yeah, my, 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 my pleasure. I hope to be come back to Italy every year. Yeah. I love, love it here. Grazie. We hope you you are doing that. Yeah. Okay.